Good evening. I'd like to call the general committee meeting to order. Would everyone please rise for the prayer and pledge of allegiance. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather as a board this evening and to make decisions which are in the best interest of your children. As we prepare to dismiss for the Mardi Gras holidays, we ask that you protect each member of our school family and to be especially mindful of those who are traveling next week. Return each of them to us safely when we reconvene. Thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon our school system. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Mr. Long, would you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please, Ms. Fochay. Mr. Campbell? Here. Ms. Harris? Here. Ms. Jackson? Here. Ms. Lee Bowman? Here. Mr. Long? Here. Ms. Lemoyne? Here. Ms. Dysart? Here. Mrs. Rodney? Here. Mr. Rodriguez? Here. Ms. Warner? Here. And Ms. White? Here. Thank you, Ms. Fochay. Um, well, happy Valentine's Day to everyone <laughs> in the board and, and the audience. Um, we will now go forward on our agenda. Uh, the first item on the agenda are the committee assignments, and in your folder you will see before you the um, committee chairman and co-chairman, and the one asterisk uh, on your name would be that it's an even-numbered month. You would be chairman for that month, and then two asterisks um, are for the odd-numbered months. <laughs> And I will read those uh, appointments at this time. On the Executive Committee, uh, Sean Warner and Catherine Lemoyne. Finance Committee, Ms. Kelly Lee Bowman and Carly Jackson. Insurance Committee, Millie Harris, Henry Rodriguez. Building Grounds Committee, Keisha Rodney and Don Campbell. Education Committee, Rosalind White and Sean Warner. And then on the external responsibilities, for the federal governmental relations is Ro Rosalind White, local governmental relations, Carly Jackson, Louisiana School Boards Association relations, Catherine Lemoyne, National School Boards Association relations, Kelly Lee Bowman, LSU Cooperative Extension relations, Mr. Don Campbell, Head Start Policy Council member, Millie Harris, Higher Education relations, Catherine Lemoyne, Bessie Relations, Sean Warner, and Louisiana Legislative Relations, Henry Rodriguez. Are there any questions or any, any comments on the uh, committee assignments? Okay, there being none, we'll move to the, the next item on the agenda, and that is the communications update, the super news. And hello, Mr. Lemoyne. Hello, and happy right Valentine's. Yeah, just as a fun cue. Uh, at the last meeting that we were all here, um, we went over the communication report, report but we had uh, cut super news um, and saved it for today. So uh, what you're gonna see is an uh, interview with all of our students of the year. So we highlighted all of our students of the year, and these are the same students who will be honored at the uh, Commitment to Community in the spring. So without further ado, we will turn it over to Super News. Injection. And now from the desk of the superintendent's office, it's time for Super News. On today's very special edition of Super News, we will meet 11 incredible young people they exemplify all that is good in our schools in and out of the classrooms each day. It's time to meet our Students of the Year. I think I was chosen because I have a lot of leadership experience and I think I would represent my school well. I feel like I do everything the AJ way and I do everything to my fullest potential. No matter if I succeed or fail, I always try my hardest. Well, I feel like I have a good leadership role in school, and I feel like I can help the other students strive to do their best. I make really good grades, but most of the nominees, we have the same grades, but I think it was my writing that I wrote, that like, I wrote good things about myself, which is true. I think they chose me because 
I represent the school well with my academic intelligence and excellence, and I'm in a lot of extracurricular stuff inside and outside of school, and I have been for a while. I think it would be because of my speaking skills and in interviews. All of my friends have told me that I project my voice really good. All of the candidates were truly amazing. I know all of them on a personal level, and I feel like all of us had an amazing chance of winning. I think I'm a very empathetic student. I'm one, I'm very intelligent, obviously, but that's not where I shine the, the most. I focus a lot on helping those around me, not just helping myself, even though it'd be a lot easier to focus solely on myself. But I enjoy focusing on other people as well. My favorite subject is math, because I understand it a lot, and I'm really good at it. I love math because we learn new things every single day, and I love to like solve problems and stuff. Like, if she's, if the teachers is like, um, Lily, come up and solve the problem, I feel very proud of myself when I get it right. I like to read uh, the Percy Jackson series and other books by Rick Riordan because he writes about like mythology and Greek gods or Roman gods or, but he also incorporates his own like. Uh, his own characters, his own heroes. I just finished Harry Potter recently. I really like that. Um, it helped. It learned um, to fight for what you believe in, and um, the the greater good always wins. I feel like it's history because I love learning about the way things used to be and how things were, and like seeing societies and cultures back in the day. My favorite thing about being a student at Goche is that we have a lot of after school programs and those really help me to explore my interests and I learned how to express myself with programs such as band, academic games, chorus, and the art club. I am in choir, I'm in band, I am chat Lee captain of the cheer squad. I am in beta, I'm secretary in beta, and academic games. I am in cheer. I absolutely love it. It's one of my outlets, something to do to get my mind off of all the frantic things going on at school, like whether it's schoolwork or since it's benchmark week, we have a lot of study guides, so I love doing cheer, and it brings me such a joy. Competition's always, it's, I've always enjoyed it, even when I played football or with Acme Games. It's a way for me to express myself mentally and challenge myself mentally, and that's something that's a lot harder to find just throughout school, because school can be challenging at times, but with Acme Games, it's always a challenge. So in school, I do a lot of um, activities, such as drama, beta, K-Kids, 4-H, art club, and I do academic games. Outside of school, I am in a theater group called The, um, the Company, and I perform at the Hacienda. I really enjoy doing theater, because I get to be close with my community and the people around me. I also am an altar server at Our Lady of Prom Sucker Church. I'm grateful for everything in my life. I think my life is really good. Like, I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for my parents. I'm grateful for a roof over our huts. My parents and my teachers at school, they always strive, like, they always make me strive for my best and always push me to the limit, and I'm happy for that. There's summits full of teachers that are just amazing at what they do, and even if you don't have them, some of my favorite teachers I never learned from, but I met them through a club or just through talking to them in the hallways, and it's a very caring environment. The teachers want to teach you, and they want you, they want to help. Miss Dizelle, which is my homeroom teacher in fifth grade, she's really nice. Um, and she helps me get my work done if I need help on something. Her name is Miss Brittany Field, and she was my third grade teacher. She inspired me so much, and that's why I want to be a teacher in the future. My fourth grade teacher, Miss Acosta. She was honest with me and my work, and she just pushed me to be a better version of myself. My English teachers, um, Miss Landry and Miss Dally, were always my favorite because they, I. They just make everything better for some reason. I don't know what it is, but they just have a touch to things. 
I think one of the best things they can give in terms of advice is grow up quick, be mature about it, because high school, the only way you do well is if you can act with maturity. Now, there's times when you can, you know, be a kid. I'm not saying don't, but when you're learning, you have to take it with, I'm a student, I'm here to learn, not a, I'm here to be with my friends. Now, of course, you can do both at the same time, and it's, that's what I find is the best experience you'll find is if you can learn and still enjoy it at the same time. All you have to do is study real hard, get good grades, and best behavior at all times in schools. I'll tell them to be kind and help everybody who needs help. I would tell a little kid or my little brother to be involved in a lot of things, uh, to make sure you're Obviously your behavior's up, you make sure to get relatively good grades on your report card, and just be involved. In my future, I plan to go to college, pursue a career in writing my own book, or whatever I feel like writing, um, and I kind of want to be an attorney because I'm good at debating and it's something I enjoy. So I want to teach kindergarten and I really want to um, help the kids actually grow and learn from their mistakes and make sure they strive and they can understand what they're learning. I'm hoping to become either a lawyer or a detective because I feel like I'm very persuasive. I'm good at, at noticing things that sometimes others don't and I feel like I would be good at both of those jobs. I really hope to go to Shalmet High because I think that they have an amazing art center and I would like to be a part of that. I also would like to go to college and major in journalism or English so where I can become a news reporter because that's really my dream career or profession and I see myself furthering in that. Obviously, Shomut High, it's, it's an amazing school. Our facilities rival most colleges. It's, you don't find it hardly anywhere in this area or just in the country in general for a public high school. But one thing we have that's more than just monetary value is our staff. Our teachers are some of the best in the world. I mean, we've produced multiple teachers who have national teacher of the year finalists. But more than that, they're just great people. They want you to learn and they want, you, they want to help you. They all are there caring about the students. They're not just there to make money or whatever it may be. They're there because they want to be. I like to live by a quote by Confucius, a Chinese philosopher who studied a lot of good behavior and ways to live a peaceful life. And what he said was, our greatest glory is never in not falling, but in rising every time we fall. And that inspires me. Never give up. Because if I gave up when I moved, I wouldn't be here. I mean, I wouldn't be sending deer if I gave up and uh, my grades fell. So I will tell them, um, don't give up and always do um, good and try to do your best. You know, because some people can't always make the best grades. What if, but if you try your best, that's all that counts. So one quote that I try to live by is a quote that is about integrity and it says integrity is doing the right thing even when no one's watching. So I try to live up to that and do the right thing no matter what situation I'm in. We'd also like to congratulate our three district-wide winners. We are proud of you and know you will represent us well. We also extend our gratitude to our teachers who help these students succeed each day. Thanks for all you do, and we'll see you all next time on Super News, where we always let the Super News roll. Thank you, Mr. Lemoyne. Yeah. And, um, Congratulations to all of our students of the year. So impressive, and they just did an excellent job um, as they're being interviewed, and they were cool, calm, and collected. And it's just wonderful to see such wonderful speakers um, and great kids. And congratulations also to all of the parents of the students of the year. That is quite an accomplishment for your students. And, 
to all the teachers who help form these these beautiful children. I thank you so much. Okay, anyone else? Well, our next Super News, we will have St. Bernard Middle School mm -hmm. and Smith Elementary will be featured. Okay. And we'll see you soon. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. And good luck to those students who are going on to um, further competition. Okay. Next item on the agenda are the presentation of school board member training certificates for the 2022 calendar year. And this, and this is with the school board member training resolution, which we will read at the regular meeting. And, um, but we can forward it to the uh, regular meeting with um, uh, requests to, to, to vote on at that time. Ms. Voce, do you want to okay, um, name those? Ooh. As everyone may know, um, the state of Louisiana has passed many criteria, not only for being a school board member, but for the continuing <coughs> education component, professional development. And that is really under the direction of the Louisiana School Board Association as well. So each board member is required to have at least six hours of training and instruction annually to satisfy the requirements of uh, revised statute 1753. And it, it must be done over a calendar year basis. So last year, in 2022, each one of our um, 11 school board members did achieve the six hours of training. We have their certificates, which we'll do at the regular board meeting and read the resolution in effect at that time. Also, um, there is an option to do additional training uh, by attending sessions from the School Board Association or different groups and organizations throughout the state that are certified to do it, as is our school system and some other groups. And we have one of our board members, you know, Ms. Kathleen Lemoyne, who has achieved under that statute 20 hours of approved training hours, and we'll be presenting her at the actual board meeting as um, the certified school board member for that year with the special distinction for the 20 hours of training. We also have three board members from the year 2022 who are, uh, well, Catherine Lemoyne and Rosalind White and Cliff England, who have achieved what is called the distinguished school board member for the entire four year term from 2019 through 2022 and to achieve that designation in the first year of being on the school board it would be 16 hours of training and each of the three years thereafter at least six hours so at our regular meeting we'll be presenting those certificates and once y'all vote on that and certify it then i'll be publishing those in our official journal as required by revised statute 1753. Thank you so much, Ms. Voce. Next item on the agenda is a building and grounds committee item. Ms. Rodney. Introduce. All right, now we'll hear from Mr. Dewey. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, I'm here tonight just to give an update and overview of our uh, building controls and energy management system update. Um, as you know, we recently went out for proposals and selected a vendor to update and upgrade our entire energy management and building control system as it pertains to all of our HVAC uh, needs across the district. So everything that automates and controls um, air conditioning, heat, dehumidification, all of those types of things across the district. We began uh, early this school year 
and have been working on throughout. So this is the brains of all of these automation systems, not the mechanical components of our HVAC systems themselves, but rather all of the automated controls. So um, basically just want to give an update on where we stand, what has been completed, and what the path forward looks like all the way through completion, and of course answer any questions that we may have as well. Um, starting, um, starting with uh, Trist, phase one of that project was completed on November 30th, and then the final phase was just recently completed, February 1st. Miro Elementary was completed on November the 30th. Davies was completed December 14th. Smith was completed on December the 5th. And Araby was completed December 16th. Um, all of these buildings are now 100% complete and upgraded as far as the automation controls, which you will note just below that as, uh, is that as the systems are brought online, the existing mechanical and controls apparatus that are in place are being recommissioned and examined. So if we find anything that is, you know, in a failed state or failing, we are getting that full report from the company who's doing the upgrades, excuse me, and also uh, making sure that those are remedied or replaced or repaired right away. So we're in that process right now. About three quarters of all of those necessary repairs are taking place as well. And then uh, we should have that complete very shortly. We are in a, in a bit of a hiatus right now with upgrading, simply because we are preparing for Shamat High School as our next major project. And as you guys know, that's, that's a monolithic campus. I mean, it's, it's very large, multiple buildings, uh, many different pieces of machinery and equipment to control. So we're working on that right now. We have all of the uh, plans being drafted for it. And we will have all of the, the plans uh, submitted and approved for that uh, by the second week of March. And then we will start right after the school year ends doing the full upgrade on that building um, with obviously state testing windows very close to starting. We don't want to get too deep into anything that could cause any significant disruptions in our building. Um, not that we've had any of that so far, but it's, it's something that we want to be extra careful with during those state testing times. So uh, we're going to have a little bit of a hiatus. We'll start right back up right there in June with that, and then we will continue through the remaining schools um, until they're complete at that point. So that's where we stand right now. Um, it's been very successful and very smooth so far. Everything has been right on time with it. Um, we have had no major issues or inconvenience to our schools as a result, even though we have been doing them while in session. So um, I've been very pleased with the results so far. Um, that being said, uh, if any specific questions I can answer on the process or, or anything where we stand or where we're going, I'd be happy to. I have two quick questions. Yes, um, the first one would be, how did you select the order in which you were going to do the schools? And then the second would be, I see that you were able to fix about 75% of the issues that were identified. What types of issues were you seeing? What were we having to change out? And do you project similar issues in the next buildings? S certainly, ma'am. Um, so as far as the order of selection, um, in all honesty, we tried to look for low-hanging fruit, things that would be the most easy, uh, easily upgradable right away. Um, it has a lot to do with like what type of protocols and the way they communicate, whether they were backnet systems or not. Um, so we were able to get into the buildings listed, and they were primarily all backnet systems. So they did not require a lot of retooling. So we were able to do those much quicker. Um, as far as what we're finding, it's it's usually small items. Um, we have thousands of sensors across the building, you know, return air, temperature sensors, supply air, humidistats, things of that nature. So um, it, most of these things are minor and, and they require just a simple, you know, replacement or possibly just recalibration. But by and large, it's usually just different types of temperature or humidity sensors that we're finding. Um, occasionally control valves for, you know, like hot water and chill water automation as well. Do you have any concerns that any of the other facilities that you felt like might take a little bit longer will have any hiccups, or do you feel like you'll be able to get this all done by December? Oh, yeah. I, I think we feel real comfortable that we're going to be able to finish on time. Um, our biggest concern uh, about time, not being able to finish by any means, but just taking a little longer is Shelmet High School, obviously, because of its size, but also because we're so many different buildings. We have some different communication protocols there, so we have to bridge those gaps and take care of those things. So uh, not a concern, just we know that we want to tackle that one and get that one done completely and efficiently so that we can move on and probably have far less uh, 
not complications, but far less to consider with the rest. Yes, ma'am. Any further questions for Mr. Dewey? Yeah, thank you, Ms. Rodney. Uh, hey, Jason, <clears throat> I'm, I'll put this on the agenda. And, you know, one of the, my concerns was when it's finished, are we going to be able to track the savings from previous to making these upgrades? Uh, absolutely. Um, because it is an energy management update, that is a, a, maybe not the prime purpose. Right. You know, obviously, we want to have the most effective automation that we can, but it's, it's a very important purpose of the whole project. So what we're going to do is once we're 100% upgraded and complete, we are also going to make sure that all of the deficiencies are corrected. We're 100% operational and, and all those ways, and then track that year over year for, you know, for at least a 12-month period and be able to compare you know, the efficiency from year over year. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely. Whatever we can save money, I think, is important. You know, and I think that's the goal of this program, to try to save some money, because I know one of our biggest expenditures is uh, utilities on the school system besides, of course, salaries and other issues. But yes, so sir. whatever we can save, you know, on that, and we can put Absolutely. back into education, I think is important. Absolutely. I mean, we anticipate significant savings. Um, we'll be able to get within about a 12-month window of when this project's complete, we should have a very specific idea on what the savings is, but we, we do anticipate a significant amount of savings from that. Thank you. And I know you're very proud of Grace. <laughs> yes, sir, I am. Yes, sir, I am. <laughs> Are there any further questions? You're welcome. Are there any further questions for Mr. Dewey? Thank you, Mr. Dewey. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Rodney. Next is an education item, Mrs. White. Hi, uh, I know we have some new board members, so I'd like to introduce myself. I am Christy Sardalamaccia. I am the literacy coordinator for our district, along with the RTI coordinator. And um, I also handle elementary ELA curriculum, along with social studies, among other things. Um, but anything literacy, that would um, be where I come in. So I just wanted to kind of give you an update. I know we did um, discuss this back in October, but you know some things have um, changed, and you know as we're progressing throughout the school year, in the beginning of the school year, our kindergarten through third grade students are given literacy screeners. It's called um, Dibbles 8 is what we use. And it's basically a temperature check to see where our students are performing based um, in regards to the rest of our um, students in Louisiana and across the nation. At that time, you know, our students are coming back from summer. We have summer regression, of course, that plays a role where, you know, students are home. They're not reading every day. They're not um, having conversations, educate academic conversations. So. We do see that even though our students leave us in May, at one point when they come back in the summer, from the summer, we usually have about a two-month regression. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, once they get back into their classrooms with their teachers and they're reading and discussing text, they quickly, you know, get back into that routine and remember, oh, I did remember that sound last year or that letter or these words. Um, so we do a little temperature check in August and then any students who scored below level, we immediately have them on what we call a literacy improvement plan. Our teachers in September met with all parents who were below level, um, who had students who were below level to discuss some strategies, interventions that they could do, in, that they're doing in the classroom with the students, but also activities parents could do to help their own children at home, because we know our parents want to be able to help their kids. They want to see them succeed as much as we do. Then again in December, we did another little temperature check where we said, let's go in and see how our kids are doing again and um, where they are performing at. The teachers again met with parents in January and said, this is where they were, this is where they are, this is what I, I see as a um, teacher that I can do to help you help your children. And again, we will assess again in April to continue monitoring what is working for our students and also how we can be of service 
to our um, parents. So there's many different things that we do in our district for literacy. One of those things is um, preparing our teachers. So all of our teachers in kindergarten through third grade are going through the science of reading professional development. It is 56 hours of coursework. Along with our teachers, our principals and assistant principals are also going through this professional development and coursework. And the reason that it's important for our administrators to do this is they go into classrooms to assist teachers and they're able to talk that talk, walk that walk with their teachers. When we have our professional learning communities, every week our teachers meet and discuss where our kids are and what else they can do to help. So that also gives our administrators the knowledge to be able to help the teachers and to, of course, help our students. That is, those are our two cohorts that started out learning the science of reading. Now we also have in August, our new cohort started of any new hires. We also just opened up for our fourth grade and fifth grade teachers, along with our middle school teachers, a new cohort that start next week on the science of reading. Because, you know, sometimes we get our students in fourth and fifth grade, they may be new to our country. And our fourth and fifth grade teachers do not teach necessarily foundational reading because our kids are already readers. So we felt like it would be great for them to become experts on how to really close those gaps when they have kids who are new to our country or just struggling students in general or just a student who may need a little extra scaffolding with the curriculum to help their um, students in their classroom. So that cohort starts next week, I'm super excited about. And also in August, we also opened it up to our pre-K teachers. Even though that's not part of what's required um, in Act 108, we decided, you know what, our pre-kindergarten students who start at four years old learning letter names and their teachers are reading to them, we felt like it would also be of a benefit for our pre-kindergarten teachers. So half of our pre-kindergarten teachers, it was not required, they wanted to be part of that cohort to learn how to help their students at the youngest age. So we're really excited to see where that's all going to bring us with our kids and you know how much growth we see with our students. Another thing that we're also um, just gearing up for, I just trained all of our first grade teachers and we are screening our students for just characteristics of dyslexia. We do not diagnose dyslexia as educators, but what we do is we do another little temperature check and say, we're gonna screen our students and see, are there any warning signs that, hey, our students may have some characteristics of dyslexia? So right now, all of our first grade students are being screened, and then in April, all of our second grade students will be screened. And from that, we then go back and look at those intervention um, literacy plans and say, what do we need to add to that to help students if they do have characteristics of dyslexia? And we notify the parents and have a meeting to give them some things that they can do at home to also assist. You know, for example, one thing that helps students with characteristics of dyslexia is a multi-sensory approach. So using at least two senses every time you're teaching a new concept to students really benefits students who struggle with dyslexia. So um, that's coming up. We also have our interventionists who are still working with our students to accelerate them. Um, they are doing an approach that we pre-teach upcoming content. So if I am a struggling student and I am really struggling with a certain concept, I'm going to hear it from the interventionist. Then I'm going to get a second dose with my teacher. So when my teacher is having discussions in class, I am able to contribute to that discussion because I've already had some background knowledge on that concept. So it really, we've, we really have um, employed this strategy in our summer learning program. And with great success, our students go to school in the fall that attend summer learning. And we have already pre-taught the first four or five weeks of content. And they're walking to a classroom sometimes for the first time feeling like, hey, I already know this. I can, I, you know, I can, um, contribute to the conversation. So it really is a, um, a great thing for our students. And our interventionists, they service our students from K-5, depending on the school and the need at that school. 
Um, it's very individualized based on, you know, at you know some grade levels. At some schools, need more assistance than other grade levels. You know, so we kind of um, look at that. We meet with the principals, meet with our teacher leaders, look at all of our data, and go, okay, we know this. You know, this first grade group need, needs a little extra help, or another school it may be third grade. So it just it really depends. It's a great thing though. Another thing that is coming down from the Department of Education is the Steve Carter Literacy Grant. That is for our kindergarten through fifth grade students that scored below level on that August literacy screen on the indicator. So every grade level has a different indicator. For example, kindergarten, we look at phoneme segmentation. Can students segment words into sounds? Um, first grade, we look at nonsense words to see if they can discriminate between the sounds in a word that they don't know from sight. And that's why sometimes parents will ask me, why are you giving them a word that's not real? What we call a pseudo word or a nonsense word? Because we want to know, do they know the word, the actual sounds, the phonemes in the word? Or if I give them a real word, I don't know if they know cat because they have a cat at home or they read cat in the hat. But if I give them a nonsense word, like the word MIP, that's not a real word, if they can tell me the individual sounds, then I know that they know the sounds that make up that word. So that's why that is really important. Um, then for, um, that was for second grade, we do oral reading fluency, because we know it's important for students to read accurately and at a sufficient rate, because if students read extremely slow, <coughs> By the time they get to the end of two sentences, they don't remember what they read at the beginning of the first sentence, so it affects their comprehension. And then for third grade, we look at our comprehension levels, reading comprehension. How are the students um, comprehending when they're reading passages? Another tutoring um, program that we have is our real-time tutoring program. That program started in 2020, and it services our kindergarten through third grade students at our UIR schools or our CIR schools. Those are our students, schools that are in urgent need of intervention. Um, their students are tutored after school by our teachers and they, it's either done virtually or in person. We prefer in person if we can accommodate that, but we have done it virtually when we were having COVID and you know, having to um, deal with all that. Our students are one-on-one -on -one tutored and they're typically tutored for about 10 hours through a, a cycle. So our cycle runs January to May, kind of like a semester. We have a summer cycle and a fall cycle. And this teacher will see the same student for those 10 hours. We now have our after school tutoring program also. <laughs> that program is for our fourth through eighth grade students. And right now we're servicing approximately 350 students after school and they are tutored with teachers. Um, sometimes we have, um, I know our education program, we have some of our students who are participants that are pre-teachers at Shelman High, pre-educators, and they're also participating to get that experience with students, tutoring, um, you know, a group of students. Everything that we give them for that program is scripted, so um, our teachers all follow the same program when they're teaching the kids. That is based on if they scored below level on um, LEAP, if they scored me, um, basic, approaching or onset, or what we say below mastery level. And then the last thing that I'd like to update is um, the parent literacy engagement. Almost all of our elementary schools at this point have had their math and literacy night, which is a great thing. We've also had community readers come in and read to our elementary students at the schools, which the kids love. If you ever have an opportunity, you wanna go read to our kids, they really love to have visitors read. And um, it really makes a difference for them to see the connection of why reading is important. I do wanna talk a little bit about the science of reading and what that is, just so that you'll have that knowledge. Um, you know, we used to take a global approach with kids and we would teach them to read. You know, we have the five press, um, progressions of reading. Now we really, with the science of reading, it's a focus on phonemic awareness, step-by-step -step phonics, and using decodable text, but not just using um, text that we are predictable level text. It is using skills that the students have already been taught. So we do not give them text that do not, that have the AI sound until we teach it, which makes sense. Um, it used to be that students learned to read in different ways. 
All the new research, all the neurological research, now shows that students build pathways in their brain that connect the speech sounds to the print. So they actually now are able to use an MRI machine and see if students are showing characteristics of dyslexia because of how the students process information when they read. So it's a really exciting new way to think of teaching. You know, we used to give students spelling lists, and they might be based on social studies content or science. And way back when, when I started teaching, um, we would have themes. You know, so we might be doing the winter theme this week, and everything was winter words. And um, it's a great time then. <laughs> but now we really have everything that is decodable and based on the patterns that the students are reading. So when they approach a word, if they don't know a word, it's teaching them look inside of that word of is there a sound we don't that we were taught that's an irregular sound, or what we call a heart word. Words that you know you have to look into your heart to find out what the sound means. So um, I think questions that y'all might have for me about our literacy program or anything. I know that was a lot. <laughs> I, I do have one thing. We were invited to participate in um, Literacy Week last yeah. week and read to students. And I really enjoyed my opportunity reading to the fourth graders at Miro Elementary. Yeah. And I was very impressed at the teachers and the students and their interest in reading and their eagerness to participate and have a guest come in and read to them. It was really heartwarming. Oh, it was fantastic. Yes. It really was. I do, um, I am curious. We've done two screeners mm -hmm. already this year. Yes. Um, based off of that December screener, yes. where do we think we are with our third and our fourth graders and concerns with how many students will need to do summer school or get right. extra support? So right now we're approximately at about 58% of our students who are on level, um, which we grew about 6%, and I'm looking for us to grow even more. Um, I'm projecting that it's approximately going to be around 30%, which the national average is about, you know, that, that's well above where NAEP was for our fourth grade students. They only have about 32% are, are proficient, or what we call mastery, and above. Okay, so I feel like um, I'm really seeing growth with our students. And I, I know in the end we're going to see that because our teachers are razor focused on what the students need. And I'm uh, really having literacy plans in place for our students and the parents going, it's just been a really great thing for our kids and our district in general. Right, you're welcome. Any other questions? I have a question um, sure. in regards to the dyslexia. I know you said that you guys are screening earlier for dyslexia, yes, which I think that's awesome. Yes. Okay, once a child is found to be dyslexic, mm -hmm. uh, I know you guys will meet with the parents and yes. give them resources. Are they given any outside, outside resources to deal with it and help with it? Because I know dyslexia is like a big word, yet scary to a lot of parents, mm -hmm. even if they do know what it means. What, is, what are we doing as far as to connect parents with outside resources to help these students? Right. So again, we don't diagnose. So what, right, so what we do yeah. is we will say that you know your child, you know we're seeing characteristics of dyslexia. Um, it really is a medical diagnosis. Yes. So all we can do as a district is to lead them in the right direction of, you know, say Children's Hospital if okay. they want to go through that. Or Nichols has a dyslexia institute that we will, you know, say. But as far as um, we can't require that. But mm -hmm. what we do do is put those accommodations in place for the student that they would receive even if they went to get that diagnosis. They still, we do not um, deny them those things just because that they don't have a medical diagnosis. Okay, so they're, they're still getting their 504 plans off the dyslexic. Depending on if it is substantially affecting their academic progress. Okay. So, so in other words, sometimes I have a student that does qualify that shows that they have characteristics, but they're on the honor roll. Yeah. So they are compensating. So they don't really for need that. But we still will say the you know we still will use that multisensory approach. And the number one thing that helps students with characteristics of dyslexia is extended time, because their processing takes longer, in order to be able to read a word. So that's really the number one thing that helps them, and that's something that we do make sure that they have in place. Okay. So thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Any other questions? Thank you. Um, thank you so much okay. for that thorough uh, presentation.
and you're doing an excellent job, and Thank so you. are our teachers. I just want to. They um, really are. They are. Mm -hmm. Such a concerted effort to get yep. these those test scores up, and the yes. dibbles, and the phonetics, and the comprehension. So uh, I just want to say thank you very much and to all our teachers who go way beyond the call and even those teachers who were, are not um, mandated to go to these um, yes. the extra curricula um, learning events yes. that they are taking part in that and they're doing the best, you know, for our students. So thank you so much. Thank you. And, and also the, the, the um, I know that the tests that are going to be given, it's in April, right? Yes, so, ma'am. Okay. To determine whether or not the students have, have to ma mandate summer school or not. Yes. Um, they'll just be notified by the parents right after those tests. Yes. As soon as, they're, they're, as the tests are administered and we input the scores, we will then have parent meetings okay. to talk with the parents regarding that. Have, no parent meetings have begun yet on that yeah. issue? So the parent the meetings for the September and um, mid-year, yes, but not until April because we have to screen them to know mm -hmm. which students will be on or above level or below level. Okay. I know that I know the students are well have been notified of, of that process. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. And, and, and we've also sent home parent activities okay. to also help our students so that the parents, so some parents, you know, they want to be able to work with their child at home. Mm -hmm. And we've also, um, our teachers are also working with them doing their intervention block. All of our students have intervention time every day that we intervene on deficits that the students have individualized to them besides their core instruction. Okay. So. Thank you. That's a lot of assessing. But um, I, I could. I will say this that. for that assessment, it's about three or four minutes. It's not um, days. It's mm -hmm. you know just a quick little um, assessment. Mm -hmm. The students are time for third grade and fourth grade. It's three minutes, so um, it's not something that takes a lot of instructional time away. Well, good. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Again. Well, I just want to thank Dr. Sardalamachia. Tough for me to say your your last name now, Christy. <laughs> but uh, okay, uh, she does an unbelievable job in leading this literacy effort, and this is something that we're putting more and more and more time into because obviously um, we're hoping that our students are going to be proficient readers by the time they exit third grade. So all of these programs are geared to that direction, and I do want to thank our teachers especially. Yes. They have had to make major adjustments. They've had to go through additional training, a lot on their own time, as well as um, led within our classrooms um, or planning times. But they have had to make major adjustments sometimes in their teaching and learning themselves. Yes. Because if you look at some of the differences in what we used to do, and you know we're old enough that we remember um, you go through a phonics situation, then you get to the sight words. Mm -hmm. We went through a whole movement of that at one time. And now with all the new brain research that's coming out that, are, that has gone into this, quote, science of reading, uh, as Christy has mentioned, those neurological pathways, they're figuring now that we have got to do more and major emphasis on the phonemic awareness and, you know, a lot that we practiced when we were kids in terms of phonics, but I want to especially thank her for all the work that she's put in on these particular programs and the training of our teachers and their, they're doing their PLCs, which are their professional learning communities, once a week or twice a week, bring in their data, looking at what their kids are doing and our principals and assistant principals are leading it on site. You know, Christy and then Leanne Harlton and Tessie Weinstein are doing a lot of that as well for our elementary teachers. So I uh, just wanted to give them a shout out because they're doing an incredible job. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you so much. Thank you. We move on to 4.2, update on school enrollment numbers. Yeah, I was asked to update the enrollment from what I had given you at the beginning of the year. Now I want you to realize these are not the official October 1 or February 1 counts. 
in September, we um, gave you the counts that you see on the bottom of this first bottom of the page where we had 7,926 students, which included our four-year-old students. Um, the February count, our last count, it is not the official February 1 count, but we've got 7,792 students, which is normal to have a decline at mid-year. If you look at it, it's primarily at the high school because many of our high school kids exit in at the end of the December semester. Many of them then go on to uh, post-secondary at that time or they get their diplomas at that time. You can see that we've had a slight, just a few pre-K um, increase, our K to five, just about stable, slight change at the middle school level. So the major difference of um, 121 kids at the high school level is due primarily to the graduates, the midterm graduates. But these are the numbers as of the other day when I pull these just to give you um, an updated count. Now I was gonna mention at the end of the, the end of the night, but I'll do it at this point. We are beginning staffing for next year. So I'm meeting with principal a uh, certain, maybe about a different, uh, maybe six <coughs> principals tomorrow individually looking at staffing needs for next year and then I'll be finishing that up after uh, the Mardi Gras holidays and uh, with the intention of posting any internal vacancies for our staff to transfer those vacancies will probably post around March the 15th and then we will have our transfer internal transfer day in early April and then once that is completed, our job fair will be um, Saturday, May 13th. But I'll go over those dates later on. But all this is a prelude to setting up next year what our staffing needs are. And it's much more intricate than just obviously the numbers, especially at the high school level with the number of Jumpstart pathways and hundreds of elective courses that we have. So it's really a monumental undertaking to do the initial staff. So we are going through that process as we speak. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, I have a question. On, with these numbers going down on a Raleigh alternative school, with them going out, is that because people? That's is that because students are giving up? They they went up slightly at Raleigh. They went up. Yeah, yeah. At it wrong. Is, yeah. yeah, the okay. bottom one was September and then currently February in February. February. Those are kids who have transferred during the school year that we've transferred from middle to our high school over to Raleigh. At 10 but also, I uh, think, and, and people don't maybe totally understand, at the alternative school, we have students other than just students that may not have functioned well in our regular or middle school a regular middle or high school program. Um, we have students who have come back to us lacking sufficient credit, so we have a more accelerated program and it's nothing to do with behavior. Um, and we have some other alternative programs there. Uh, students who may be new to the country that need maybe more um, pointed language learning issues, you know, or to deal with we may start them there or uh, those types of programs. Thank you very much. It's good to know that students aren't giving up. Oh, no, no, no. Really, the, decre the decrease we have at the high school, really the, the kids who are, for the most part, have graduated yeah, in December understand. and completed. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else have these questions? I have a Nearly. larger question, I guess. It's more philosophical than anything. So looking at our K-5 as compared to our 6-8, that's a significant drop, right, in enrollments, if you think about it from like middle, elementary to middle school. Have we heard from parents? Obviously, I'm new to this, so I'm looking to you all with experience. Do we know why we see so many kids leave? Well, we have seven grade, we have 
seven grade levels in the K to five. I mean, we well, not seven, six grade levels in the K to five, only three grade levels in the middle school. So it should be about half the number of students, which middle school does exceed half of the K to five. So I don't think there is a drop at that point. When I'm looking at the demographics and I'm looking at all of our uh, just holistically kindergarten, first, second, third, the glut of our kids right now and what we plan for are actually at the eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh grade levels. They are declining um, in the K to five, and that's if you just, you know, you, you read even in Orleans when they're talking about declining enrollment and Jefferson declining enrollment, uh, I think the birth rates in those particular years, because even though <coughs> there's declining public school, it's not increasing private school registration is what they had come up with. So we're not losing them. In fact, um, in the three grade levels, like I said, at middle school, it's more than half of the six grade levels at K to five. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? One quick question. Joe? Um, Ms. Fulcher, the um, how total enrollment, uh, it's closing in on 8,000. How does that compare with uh, the pre-Katrina numbers? you remember? Pre-Katrina numbers, including four-year-olds, and we had, we were going to start a little three-year-old program that the year it hit. We had about 8,800. 8,800 students. Okay. Um, so the, if, I, if my memory serves me well, 17, 18 years ago, mm -hmm. um, and the percentage that we have now is really a greater percentage than the repopulation figures of the community as a whole. Right. So that's, that's telling me at. that younger families have moved in um, since Katrina has hit. So while we have less enrollment, we also have fewer people. So right, if you take, right. what do we have now, 45,000? I, I don't know, I'm just off the top of my head, as compared to 67 or 68,000 right. residents prior to, and that percentage is less than the 7,900 over 8,800. So that's, that's encouraging. <laughs> but it just, yeah. That's encouraging. So we have, I think, a lot of families moving in with younger children. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, back to you, Dan. Thank you, Ms. White. Next item on the agenda is the review of performance contracts. Ms. Voce? Um, Just to say that, you know, all of our administrators, as you know, y'all had in the past approved the actual contracts, and then I go ahead and fill them. So this is informational at this point. All of our administrators, we usually put on two-year performance um, contracts, and this, and we give them 120 days notice, as or I do, give them 120 days notice as to potential renewals. The 16 people that you see listed here, their con their performance contracts are up on June 30th of 2023. So I am, in, I will be informing them that they are, that I intend to renew their contracts for a two-year period from July 1 of 2023 through June 30th of 2025. Um, and those 16 people that you see here, the other half of our um, maybe administrative teams are in the other two-year period with them. Are there any questions at this time? It's just notification at this point. Just a, a quick statement. Just um, all of these um, administrators and supervisors uh, on this list are, are um, wonderful, and we are very blessed to have such hardworking and dedicated uh, administrators on our team and to continue with us for another two years. Yes. Absolutely. And thank them all for their their um, hard work and their dedication. Thank you. Okay. Next is a review of personnel changes for February 2023. 
Good evening, everyone. Okay, you should have the personnel changes in front of you. Um, I do want to point out that we have a few retirements to announce. We do have Ms. Kay Simon. <coughs> she is a longtime teacher. We will have her until the end of the year, though. Um, she's a longtime teacher. Right now, she is a special education teacher at Araby Elementary, <coughs> and she will be missed. We also have um, Ms. Rose Barone. She's a Davies preschool paraeducator. I can tell you that my daughter, my granddaughter Cora, is in her class and misses Ms. Rose greatly. So she is missed. Um, Ms. Oline Bowden, she is one of our custodians at, Sh at Shelmet High. And Donna Baker, who is a cafeteria tech at Araby Elementary. These employees have worked very, very hard for our school system, and we will miss them. We do still have Miss Donna Baker until the end of the year, but Miss Barone and Miss Bowden have already resigned. They've retired and are enjoying themselves now. Okay, and also I just want to add to if we have any questions. Obviously. Um, we had an opening that we advertised for for the assistant principal at Raleigh Alternative School because Ms. Sanchez, Urban Sanchez, was elevated and appointed as the principal. So Ms. Um, Ms. Tanisha Urban Sanchez and Ms. Pritchard conducted the interviews for the assistant principal and they've recommended to me and um, we are appointing Stephen Hosenthal as the assistant principal of Raleigh Alternative School. Mr. Hosenthal has been a teacher for 15 years, the last seven years at Raleigh Alternative School. He's worked very closely with the former principal, Mr. Cipollone, and the current uh, principal, Ms. Irvin Sanchez, um, and he's been instrumental in developing some of the policies and procedures at the school. And he's done an excellent job as a teacher and a team leader and has stepped into those uh, temporary positions at different times. So Ms. Irvin Sanchez has recommended that he be her assistant principal at Raleigh Alternative School. So I wish to appoint him at this time. Right. Congratulations to Mr. Holzenthal. I have a question, I'm sorry. Well, Mr. Warner. <coughs> Mr. Holzenthal, has he been with the school system? 15? Mr. Who? He's been here for 15 years? Or no, he has he been came. a teacher for 15. He has been with us for Raleigh. the last seven, seven. at Raleigh. Okay. Right. That was my question. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Any questions? Just a very happy retirement and a thanks for the many years of service to all of our retirees. Kay Simon, Rose Barone, Olean Bodden, Donna Baker, and um, you know, we, we will, you will be missed, but thank you for your many years of service to the students at St. Bernard Parish. Did thank you me. have anything else, Ms. Bertrand? <coughs> okay. And there are no other questions? I'll first thank, thank you. you very much. Good job. Okay. Next item is a finance committee item. Ms. Lee Bowman. Item number 6.1, we request to solicit proposals for ELA workbooks correlated to Louisiana student standards for grades two to fifth grade. Ms. Hi, everyone. I want to also thank Dr. Soto Lamaccia for um, giving you that refresher on literacy because she does a great job and she's involved in so much of it. We work hand in hand, but she does the bulk of that literacy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> every year when we order books, we order from the state website. All our books that we use for core are tier one. Okay. However, every three years, if there's a book that we want as a supplemental book that we use for intervention, for remediation, in the classroom, we have to put out a bid for proposals. It's a request for funding for, um, for these books, okay? So we just, we're here today to just ask your permission to put out the bid, to put out this bid for grades two through five. They use this as a supplemental workbook. And um, it has to be based on the Louisiana school standards. After we get all the, the companies in to submit their, um, their, their product, we have a rubric that we score each workbook on, and I'll be back when we get all those back to tell you which one got the proposal from us, got the bid from us. But basically, it's just a, a, a request to, um, to go out for bids right now. Okay? 
Any question from the board? Mr. Warner? I, I don't have a question. I'll just I'll make a motion that uh, that we go out request to solicit proposals for ELO ELA workbooks correlated Louisiana student standards for grades 2.5. All right, I have Mr. Warner. Ms. White's going to second. Please vote on your board. Whoops. Somebody voted twice. Okay, motion passes 11 0. And my second proposal is for. Um, library providers, um, every three years we have to put out a request for proposals from companies to ask for what we need with library books. And we get librarians to look at the rubric and decide which company or companies they wanted to go with. Because in the past, we did use two companies because they came out like almost tied. So we took two companies to, to provide, but I don't know if that's gonna happen this year. Just that we have to put out a request for proposals for libraries, right. library products. Any comments? Absolutely. Second. We have a motion from uh, Ms. Dysart and second from Mr. Long. Please cast your vote. In your <coughs> motion passes 11 0. <coughs> All right. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Let's <laughs> go. <laughs> All right, item number 6.3, request for permission to advertise to bid for bread and bread products for the period of July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024 for the St. Bernard Parish School Board. Mr. Morales is going to give us an update on that. Hello, everyone. Good evening. So, yes, I'm here to request permission to advertise for uh, bread and bread products for the next school year, July 1st, 2023 through June 30th. 2024. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Ms. Um, Lemoyne's going to make the first, and Ms. Jackson is the second. Please vote on your keyboard for us. I have a question. Uh, oh, sorry. So, have you, so the last year's bid was for a year also? Yes. Okay. And so, um, have you noticed inflation has taken effect on the uh, on some of our products? Uh, the uh, sound of bread, bread wasn't um, not too bad. Okay. Milk has gone up a little a little bit. It does fluctuate, but we'll talk about that. That's a, the next one. It's for the bread, bread, so. You think we can afford that for our students, bread? We can. I think we do. Okay. <laughs> Good. Any more comments from the board? Please cast your votes for me. Motion passes 11 0. <coughs> Our next one 6.4 request for permission to advertise to bid for milk and milk products for the period of July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024 with the St. Bernard Parish School Board. The second school would say yes, it's here just to uh, request permission to advertise for milk and milk products for next school year, Ju July 1st, 2023 through. June 30th, 2024. So, so what percentage so, do you think it's uh, they're looking at as far as an increase? It, it doesn't, it fluctuates maybe less than a, a nickel, but not a whole lot per ounce. It goes up and down a little bit, not uh, too much, just staying kind of steady right now. It's kind of leveled out. Well, that's so, good. Uh, I'll make a motion that we send this to the full board with a recommendation. Ms. Jackson's going to second. Please cast your votes on the board one. Motion passes 11 0. The next item is 6.5 request for permission to advertise to bid for food products for the period of July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024 for the St. Bernard Parish School Board. So, yes, this is for um, request for permission to bid. For all of the rest of the food products, basically that's our canned goods uh, from July 1st through June 30th, <coughs> July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024. Any comments on the board? Any comments? No? Ms. White? Please? Anybody second? 
Ms. Lemoyne, second. Please cast your vote, please. Motion passes, 11 0. Thank you, Ms. Lemoyne. Thank, Thank you. Next item on the agenda are superintendent's notes. Ms. Loche. Um, just to re reiterate a little bit about the staffing and make sure I got those dates right. We're staffing the next couple of weeks um, and posting internal vacancies on March 15th. April 8th is transfer day. We hope to get interviews done prior to Saturday, April 8th. And then once the internal transfers have been accomplished, we will have our job fair on May 13th, which will be for any applicant from both inside or outside of the school system who is certified and um, they would come then and interview with the principals of each of the schools for jobs for this coming year. A reminder to everyone that our Special Olympics will be Friday, March the 10th. It's always a wonderful, wonderful day. The high school kids or the buddies for each Special Olympian, and it'll be out at the Shumut High Football Stadium and Track um, at 9.30, beginning at 9.30 a.m. on Friday, March the 10th. Uh, the Chamber, <clears throat> just to mention again, has uh, partnered over the, this will be the second year with the Women's Professional Network, where that portion of the Chamber um, will, many of the professional women will come in, meet with um, our girls, our female students at Shelmet High School in talking with them about careers and doing some mentoring and it was a wonderful event last year and that will take place on Monday, March the 13th. And right now the spring play is scheduled. They're intending to do Anything Goes um, in the Cultural Arts Center from March 16th through March 19th. Now we're going to be having more um, exposure and advertising for that. I just wanted to mention it at this point and tickets will be available at that time. And our kids have been marching in many of the parades from Mardi Gras the last few days, and they will be active and are active this week and this coming weekend. And of course, next week, Mardi Gras week, there'll be student holidays. However, our office will be open on Thursday and Friday of next week, but our schools will be closed the entire week, and our students will return them Monday, February 27th. Thank you, Ms. Vote. Anyone else? Okay. Well, on behalf of the whole board, we'd like to wish everyone a safe and a happy Mardi Gras. And we'll see all of our students back after the Mardi Gras holiday. And um, with that, Mr. Campbell, do you have a motion? There's a motion by Mr. Campbell. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Harris. All in favor aye. of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you and good night.